Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Oslika. I have the immense pleasure to introduce uh, my colleagues, Dr. Romain Manet and Dr. Laurent Gergele from France, who are going to talk about uh, post-traumatic hydrocephalus. You probably all know that post-traumatic hydrocephalus is a very complex entity. And we have uh, certain very distinctive time frames to diagnose it, investigate it, and manage it if we want to do it timely. Everything is very, very complex. But coming back to our lectures, Romain is associated with University of Lyon and Saint-Étienne. He's neurosurgeon and his special interest is in neurosurgery in CSF circulation. And um, uh, Laurent Gergele is intensivist. He's also, and or he was associated with University of Lyon, University of uh, Saint-Étienne. He also um, uh, works close to Loire Valley. This is magnificent scenery and magnificent region of France. If you have any opportunity, please visit it. Uh, and they both will be talking about post-traumatic hydrocephalus. So, dear friends, voila, it's your stage. Thank you, Marek. Thank you, Marek. Um, we are very pleased and very honored to uh, give this talk on uh, post-traumatic CSF disorders. We want to warmly thank um, have the you shown your screen? Sorry. Sorry? Have you shown your screen? Okay. I'm sorry about that. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Thank you to uh, the co members of this uh, CSF task force for dedication and their great work in creating this task force. Um, we also warmly thank you, uh, Marek, for chairing this session. It's a great honor to have you uh, with your uh, very huge knowledge on CSF dynamics. Um, I'm happy to give this talk with uh, Laurent. Uh, we worked together for 10 years uh, and we are very interested in uh, CSF disorder, especially uh, CSF disorders following uh, traumatic and non-traumatic brain injury. So our talk is divided in uh, two parts. Uh, the first part is dedicated to uh, the management of post-traumatic ventriculomegaly. And the second part will be uh, dedicated to the management of post-traumatic extraaxial fluid collections. So let's uh, begin with the first part, and I let the floor to Laurent. We will um, introduce you a case uh, discussion. Yeah, I'm going to speak a very short message about the acute uh, hydrocephaly in uh, intensive care units. Sorry, uh, because uh, it's not the very important point, the odd point of this uh, presentation. It's only to, to put one message. The main message of the acute uh, hydrocephaly in ICU is that the, the, the size of the ventricles is, could be normal, but normal is not normal when the ICP is high. It's only the, this message important for this uh, acute uh, uh, hydrocephaly. So uh, I just want to speak about one point of uh, EVD in ICU, it's easy for the intensivist to know when I need the EVD, but it's very, very difficult and there is very few literature to know when I can remove it. And I think it's very important point for the, 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 the next stage because uh, uh, when we remove the EVD, the patient is not hydrocephalus patient, but perhaps it is. And we have to better understand this part of the winning of the EVD and Roman is going to make us a, a, re a review of the literature. So to our knowledge, uh, there are very few um, 
precise guidelines regarding the uh, the modalities to win an EVD. And if you look in uh, the, the the actual guidelines, the only uh, recommend uh, thing is that we have to remove the EVD as soon as possible uh, to avoid the infections uh, problem in particular. But uh, that's all. And we don't have any precise marker to know which patient is shunt dependent and should receive a shunt and uh, which patient uh, is not shunt dependent and uh, just don't need any shunt. Uh, a few years ago, we uh, analyzed um, some TBI patients that were managed in ICU and we received an EVD. Uh, they were 144 patients. And among the 102 survivors, uh, we noticed that 39% uh, 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 needed a shunt. Uh, and among this population, uh, you see that uh, more than one third of them receive a delayed shunt. That means they receive a shunt, uh, but in uh, uh, after a long delay because they initially were considered as non-shunt dependent. So one third of the patient had a delayed uh, management, which probably affect the prognosis. If you look at the uh, outcome of the patients. The patients who receive uh, early shunt uh, had no extra neurological morbidity. Their MRS, means the neurolog neurological outcome, were equivalent uh, at the moment of discharge of the ICU, at the moment of the EVD winning, before the shunt and after the shunt. In the group of delayed shunt, the uh, neurological outcome were worse. And we will discuss that later. In this patient, it's very difficult to know if uh, they are shunt dependent or not. And we can see that the shunt correct this misdiagnosis. But this means that if you don't insert a shunt in these patients, they have an extra neurological morbidity uh, in addition with the uh, primary brain lesions. So I've, we think this is a very important message is that the patient who are win of EVD uh, and incorrectly consider as shunt independent has clearly an extra uh, neurological morbidity. So uh, it's very difficult to manage this patient after the, the ICU because uh, the patient uh, arrive in the rehabilitation center with a city like the, this city. We can see there is a big ventricle in the both sc CT scan, and we will see in the next the next slide that there is difference between the two two patients, Mr. P and Mr. C. Mr. C. Um, if you look yeah. in, in the literature, the post-traumatic ventriculomegaly is a frequent uh, condition. Uh, it is usually um, considered that ventriculomegaly uh, is defined that the, with an events ratio superior to 0 0.3. Uh, if you look in the literature, uh, it, uh, ventriculomegaly may occur between 30 and 78% uh, of traumatic brain injury patients. It has been shown that uh, this ventriculomegaly happen more frequently in severe TBI than in moderate TBI. And it has been also shown that patient, TBI patients with ventriculomegaly have a worse outcome than TBI patients without ventriculomegaly. So among this uh, patient with ventriculomegaly, there are clearly an extra morbidity but the, the difficulty is to uh, interpret this ventriculomegaly that can uh, uh, result from an avacuo uh, uh, ventriculomegaly uh, resulting uh, from atrophy, but it can also result from an active hydrocephalus, uh, which is commonly uh, described as 
post-traumatic hydrocephalus. It is very difficult uh, to define what is actually uh, a post-traumatic hydrocephalus. And if you look back in the literature, uh, the problem is ongoing for uh, a long time. In this publication from Akim, uh, which is a little, be little less um, famous than the one in the NEGM, uh, they describe three patients. And on, uh, in these three patients, two of them are traumatic brain injuries. The clinical presentation of uh, post-traumatic hydrocephalus uh, can, uh, uh, can uh, display some of the Akim's triad uh, features, which are gait disturbance, um, urinary problems, and cognitive impairment. These signs can be seen uh, in patients with uh, light neurological impairment following traumatic brain injury but uh, it is uh, much more difficult to, uh, to see that in heavily uh, neurologically impaired patients uh, who are bedridden, uh, we, who are uh, urinary catheter, and who have uh, conscious impairment. So the most important thing in the clinical presentation of this patient is uh, the clinical evolution, and most of the time uh, we see patients that improve after traumatic brain injury, and that then uh, after a while they present a secondary stagnation or sometimes a worsening, which is not normal uh, uh, in absence of uh, new conditions. Uh, Post-traumatic hydrocephalus rarely occur on an acute mode. Uh, and in this case, uh, it is um, uh, um, a clinical presentation of raised ICP with impaired consciousness, uh, headaches, and uh, sixth nerve palsy, and, uh, and so on. Uh, Regarding the radiological presentation of PTH, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, the ventriculomegaly, as I, uh, I, I told uh, earlier, but um, I, uh, we didn't find any robust specific radiological markers, um, except an interesting publication from uh, Missouri and Al, uh, who describe a flow void in the aqueduct um, that could be a marker of uh, PTH and uh, patient, shunted patients that improve after shunting had a flow void disappearance, disappearance and shunt non-responders uh, keep the flow void in the aqueduct. So it could be a marker, but it definitely needs uh, further investigations. Uh, we think the most important uh, message uh, to, 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 to define post-traumatic hydrocephalus is the um, uh, addition of ventriculomegaly and uh, abnormal neurological clinical uh, evolution uh, with a stop in improvement or a worsening. And we will see later that we also have some uh, objective markers of ICP or CSF dynamics. Is it a rare problem? Uh, if you look at the literature, the prevalence is a uh, very uh, range between uh, one to 45%. Uh, so in fact, it depends on how, uh, how is the, 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 the precision of the screening. And, uh, the 45% appears in this publication from uh, Mazzini et al., uh, where they very closely screen patients clinically and radiologically and define these huge numbers of post-traumatic hydrocephalus. Uh, in the compressive craniectomy, uh, which is a, a, a very specific situation, post-traumatic hydrocephalus uh, uh, appears very frequent also. We won't have time to discuss about that in this talk, but uh, obviously there are a very strong link between the 
stressive craniectomy and CSF disorders. Uh, regarding the time course of PTH, it is usually uh, described occurring between one to three months after TBI. But once again, uh, it is probably misdiagnosed because of the difficulty of the diagnosis and probably insufficiently screened. Among the risk factors uh, that has been described in the literature, uh, one of the most important is the occurrence of traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage on uh, admission CT scan and uh, the, occurrence, uh, the, the, the occurrence of decompressive craniectomy. So, Laura, please go on with the case. Yeah, uh, we, we chose this, this case because it's very important to uh, understand that the, the message is uh, the intensivist knows very good the acute hydrocephalus, but uh, uh, they want to remove the EVD, and after uh, the patient uh, leaves the service, leaves the unit, and uh, it's finished to speak about hydrocephalus for this patient. But like explained woman just before, the diagnosis is very often uh, under diagnosis because it's difficult when the patient is not uh, normal. Um, like you can see here, the patient uh, uh, on this slide uh, developed uh, hydrocephalus, secondary hydrocephalus, and uh, uh, it's not very um, evident that the, when you see this uh, CT scan without uh, come back for the first CT scan. So the message is very important to screen all the patients after intensive care unit for brain injury, not only for traumatic brain injury, for all brain injury. Um, we are, we are, after Roman is going to speak about the CSF dynamic assessment, because we decided two years ago, after my great year with Marek in uh, Cambridge, to screen all the patients after uh, ICU when they arrive in Lyon in Saint Etienne in the rehabilitation center. And we focus our screening around the dynamic assessment of CSF. And Roman is a specialist of this test and is going to explain you uh, the modalities of the test. Well, um, in fact, the, the first thing is uh, the simple ICP measurement that, as you all know, uh, it can be measured uh, in the cranial cavity through a, a ventricular catheter or a parenchymal transducer, but it can also be measured at the level, at the lumbar level, uh, provided that the patient is, is in a supine position. Uh, this ICP measurement can uh, help to classify patient uh, in a raised ICP that will uh, a ventriculomegaly plus a raised ICP will correspond to an active high pressure hydrocephalus, and uh, it will be quite easy to manage. Uh, the second situation is uh, more difficult to manage is the situation of a low ICP. Uh, in the sorry, in the, um, the the problem is that the uh, cutoff of a raised ICP is still unclear. Uh, it has been proposed at 15 by uh, Marmaru in a publication, uh, in quite ancient publication, uh, and the INPH guidelines. Uh, the cutoff of raised ICP is 18. And in classic ICU, it is considered uh, raised when above 20 millimeter of mercury. But anyway, uh, um, if patient has uh, uh, ICP close to 20, it must be considered as high. And if is uh, under 15, it is considered as normal. So in the second situation, uh, it is very useful uh, to uh, have a CSF dynamics assessment. I won't come back uh, in detail on this uh, infusion study because Marek and Zofia uh, made a very uh, excellent uh, webinar in September, and you can uh, you can see it on uh, on uh, YouTube. In in brief, uh, you measure the uh, CSF pressure within the cranial cavity or within the lumbar cavity with a, a lumbar needle, you record the pressure and you record the uh, results uh, of the infusion of MOC-CSF within the craniospinal cavity. Uh, 
uh, and to calculate some uh, CSF dynamics parameters. And among them, the most study is the resistance to CSF outflow, which is called air out. And so if we come back to our problem, in the case of a low ICP with ventriculomegaly, if the air out is raised, uh, it is uh, in favor of uh, normal pressure idocephalus, secondary to traumatic brain injury. And if the air out is low, it will mean that the ventriculomegaly corresponds to an atrophy. Uh, just as for ICP, the uh, cutoff of a raised R out is still to be determined. So in, uh, in, 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 in summary, uh, the post-traumatic hydrocephalus can occur on uh, high pressure mode, but most of the time is uh, low pressure hydrocephalus with disturbed CSF dynamics. So we, we come we came back we come back with uh, our patients Mr P and Mr C. It's, it was last week in the uh, station center. Uh, we now like I explained just before we we are screening all patients uh, arrive in uh, this unit and when the ventricles are too big and bigger than before the aggression we uh, we are going to to screen the patient and for this patient we are going to make uh, to do uh, infusion study. So for in this example, it's Mr. C and uh, Mr. C uh, has this CT scan uh, 90 days after the traumatic brain injury. And like you can see, it was the first CT scan before the edema. And we have uh, increasing of the uh, volume of the ventricles. So we performed the infusion study, and like you can see, we have normal PVI with pressure volume index. Uh, is a mean to, to qualify the compliance, and here the resistance are low. So we didn't uh, put the indication of uh, deriv derivation for this patient because it's more uh, atrophy than hydrocephalus. And the other example with Mr. P and the CT scan is no very different with the increasing of the volume of CSF. And in this case, we have a low compliance and a low res uh, high resistance. So we decided for this patient to uh, make the surgery uh, for the derivation. And uh, with this uh, tool, we can uh, uh, check the patient, screen the patient and uh, put good indication of surgery, and I think better indication than only with, uh, only, than, uh, only with uh, the, uh, the picture of the CT scan or MRI, because there is no very good, uh, uh, in, uh, good, uh, to, good science to definize the patient with agrocephalus or uh, atrophy only on, this, on the picture. So it's very important message because uh, we think with Roman that this patient in just after the ICU, there is very few literature and uh, few interest of the uh, intensivist because it is the end of the acute phases with the high ICP and a uh, lot of uh, uh, tools that we, we, we like this, far, this part of the, the disease. And when the patient leaves the, the unit, it's different. And uh, probably there is a lake in the, in the care in this part. So to shunt or not to shunt, uh, Roman is going to explain you the, the, the summarize of the ventriculomegaly, post-traumatic ventriculomegaly, and uh, the, the, the home message. Yeah. So um, once again, uh, during the acute phase, uh, an acute ventriculomegaly will, uh, will often be easy uh, to manage because uh, it's, uh, uh, it will raise the ICP uh, uh, and the ventricle uh, enlarge very quickly. So the treatment is, uh, of course, an external drainage, with, which is uh, very uh, often performed uh, as a EVD. But as we will talk about a little bit later, some very specific situation can be managed by, by uh, EVD, uh, ELD, for, sorry. Uh, it is more difficult to deal with the uh, delayed onset of uh, post-traumatic ventriculomegaly. Once again, it is very important to consider the clinical evolution 
and uh, a stop in the clinical improvement or a worsening in neurological improvement uh, should uh, interpel and uh, should um, uh, should uh, uh, warrant uh, an attentive screening. Once again, we can uh, classify this situation uh, according to the ICP. If the ICP is raised, which is quite not often, uh, it will uh, be considered as a high pressure hydrocephalus. But if the pressure is low, uh, we must have some CSF uh, dynamics assessment to make the difference between an atrophy uh, we, uh, in which the CSF dynamics are normal and the resistance to CSF outflow is low. Uh, uh, and it is different uh, with the situation of the uh, impaired CSF dynamics and uh, in particular with uh, increased resistance to CSF outflow. In the atrophic case, of course, uh, there, uh, there is no need for shunt. But in the situation of um, high pressure hydrocephalus or uh, secondary uh, post-traumatic normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, a shunt is, uh, of course, needed. What are the results of, uh, of uh, shunt in, in shunting post-traumatic hydrocephalus? Uh, former, uh, former literature shows that uh, the results may be better than uh, shunting idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, and if you look in the modern literature, the improvement after shunting range between 50 to, uh, uh, to 83 percent. Just like in INPH, these results probably uh, depend on the quality of the uh, assessment and on the, the quality of the, the choice of the good candidate for shunt. And the more precise you are in your, your, your diagnosis, and the most uh, important will be, uh, and the, the, the better will be the result of the surgery. Among the, the factors associated with poor outcome, uh, the most uh, reported and probably the most important is the occurrence of a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which uh, can be very thin on the initial uh, admission CT scan. So it is very important to, uh, to screen that on the admission CT scan. And among the factors associated with a good outcome, uh, there is the, uh, the short delay of uh, shunting. Uh, as uh, it is shown in this uh, very interesting publication, uh, where you can see the, um, the uh, functional outcome according to the delay between traumatic brain injury and shunt insertion. And as you can see, there are uh, much uh, more good outcome when uh, the shunt is in inserted uh, soon, and soon is as soon as 37 days after the TBI, which means a little bit more than one month after the TBI. And you see that when you uh, uh, put the shunt more, uh, 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 more delayed, the functional uh, results are far less good. So, we think this publication is very, very important, and the message is very important that the sooner uh, uh, we treat the patient and the better are the, the outcome. Uh, if you look in the real life, uh, as that can be illustrated in this uh, uh, interesting publication, that uh, is a population-based cohort study uh, describing more than 20,000 TBI patients, they found only uh, less than 5% of post-traumatic hydrocephalus among the population with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and a little bit more than 1% of PTH in TBI patients without uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in this real life, uh, report 
uh, only 5% of TBI uh, are, uh, are screened as uh, post-traumatic hydrocephalus. So probably we do a too few diagnoses. And if you look at the delay of the diagnosis, the first delay is three months. If you look back at this slide, uh, three months is uh, almost too late to, to shun patients. So to summarize, uh, it is very important to uh, carefully screen patients and the sooner the diagnosis is uh, put, the sooner the patient is treated and probably the best are, uh, is, uh, the, best is uh, the prognosis. So I think we are in time, Marek. Uh, we are at the half of our presentation and now we will uh, go on uh, with the management of post-traumatic extract cell fluid collections. Um, just before us uh, carry on, I, I want to insist on this point that you have to be very accurate and systematic in the analysis of the patient after ICU and TBI, in, in particular when the patient has a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, it's a good uh, junction with the, the next uh, slide. You have a question, Mark? No, not so far. Let's uh, finish the second part. And uh, we will have the question session. OK, perfect. So it, I, I carry on. And it's very important to, to keep in your mind that it's important to be very accurate in the analysis of the picture of the CT scan and to compare the CT scan in the time, because uh, it's uh, the, the, the main tool to analyze uh, the changement of the volume of the CSF. And it's not very important, like we can see on this first case report. It's one case report of uh, uh, Marek Hospital uh, of Cambridge uh, with a patient collapse in the street. Uh, the Glasgow, initial Glasgow was not very bad, it was 11. And we have a big uh, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage with frontal contusion. And uh, at the first day of the patient, we have this CT scan, not very, not very bad. And uh, we can see that the, the mean ICP for the, the first two days was low with 6.3 and uh, with a good autoregulation with a perix uh, around zero. And uh, uh, two days later, patient has a new CT scan and uh, in the, the conclusion of the radiologist, it was the same CT scan. And if we have a very accurate analysis, we can see there is a, a, a thin, the thin uh, thickness of CSF around the brain appears on this slide. And we can see uh, the cortical cell as larger, uh, are larger, and uh, uh, there is a communication on the basal system. And in this situation, the patient has very high ICP because the mean ICP was 24.7, and the patient lost the autorization with the PIRX around 0.27. So the, the CT scan is more or less the same, but there is this detail, and this data is very important because there is a big prediction on the ICP. The, the next of the story of this patient is uh, increasing the CSF volume ar around the brain in the subarachnoid space. And the, the, the conclusion of the radiologist was always the same, stable appearances. But there is a new CT scan at day six and another one at day seven and day nine because the physician didn't uh, understand why the ICP was high. And the solution is here, but to see the solution, you have to take time and to be accurate in your lecture, in your analysis of the CT scan. And uh, if we uh, carry on the story, the radiologists change the analysis of the CT scan and speak about subdural hygromas, no hydrocephalus. It was uh, the real conclusion of the radiologist and in the same for the 24 days later. So the message of this case report is nobody take care about this collection and uh, the name is very often Igroma and we are going to see it's not exactly this point. Just before uh, Roman make uh, do to us uh, a lesson of anatomy, 
I want to speak about the importance of uh, the volume of CSF in subarachnoid space from the, the team from uh, New York with uh, Professor Ricketts uh, um, published 10 years ago this paper, very interesting paper, where he explained the importance of this volume of CSF around the brain. And he explained too that it's very difficult to analyze this part of the volume. And in this paper, I explained that when you have the increasing of the thickness of the CSF around the brain of two millimeters, it's like you have increasing of the ventricles like on this, on, on this design, it's more than 100 milliliters of CSF. So it's very important that to take care about this point because in my experience in France, in England, uh, it's uh, for all it's igroma and uh, Roman is going to explain us it's not really igroma but it's external agrocephalus. Just before I want to speak about my work in the Marek team. Uh, I, I spent one year in, uh, in the brain physics lab and I uh, analyzed a retrospective cohort of uh, traumatic brain injury of Cambridge between uh, 2014 and two, uh, 2016. And I, uh, I try to uh, analyze this uh, accumulation of CSF around the brain. And we analyze the 143 patients. Uh, we remove the craniectomy because like we explained at the start of the lecture, it's not the same pathology. And we, we can speak about this patient. It's very specific. And I think we have to make a specific webinar on this uh, thematic. And we, we keep 102 patients to uh, the final analysis. And uh, uh, we, uh, we isolated uh, 31 patients developed accumulation of CSF around the brain in subarachnoid space and 71 patients without external endocrifers. And we compare these two groups and the main uh, important uh, risk factor to develop this accumulation of CSF around the brain in subarachnoid space, external endocrifers group is the traumatic subarachnoid uh, MOH. Uh, Stockholm CT scan is a, a, a Stockholm score, is an important score to uh, classify the patient with TBI on the first TBI. And the Stockholm score uh, as a big part is a traumatic uh, subarachnoid MOH. Uh, when we compare the two groups, uh, they have uh, more and less the same uh, Glasgow, the same uh, um, gravity. Uh, the group of uh, uh, EH was a little bit old, older, uh, two years of difference. And uh, for the, all, the rest of the characteristic was the same. So the patient with external hydrocephalus, they have longer mechanic ventilation, longer ICU length, uh, more CT scan or MRI uh, because the patients are more complex. Uh, Precotomy was more often and shunt surgery uh, too. And we have more secondary ventricle dilatation. And there is a little bit difference in the GOS ELRG uh, with uh, patients have a worse uh, evolution in uh, uh, EH group than in non-EH non -EH group. So to conclude, uh, there is two ICP consequences because we have a higher ICP after the diagnosis of EH than before, like I can show you in the case report. And to conclude about the external aquifers in this uh, uh, cohort analysis, seems to impair the short and long-term prognosis, uh, seems to increase the risk of secondary hydrocephalus because we have more ventricular megaly uh, in the EH group. Uh, external aquifers is not exceptional in 30% of the patients. Uh, external aquifers could be treated. We can see at the end of our lecture the uh, uh, possi um, possibility to treat this accumulation of CSF. And uh, EH is not only in TBI, but is not the, the topic of this lecture. So um, Roman is going to explain us uh, the anatomy. And uh, as neurosurgeon, he's going to uh, try to explain us the mechanism of uh, external hydrocephalus and the consequences on the ICP and the volume on the brain. Thank you. When uh, you look in the literature, the, the problem of 
post-traumatic uh, fluid collections around the brain has been described a very long time ago and received uh, a, a high number of, uh, of name. Uh, the most commonly used is uh, the term subdural hygroma, which has been introduced by Dandy. Um, the term external hydrocephalus has uh, been uh, most, uh, most of the time described for uh, children, but very few in adult patients. Uh, and so we think it is important to go back to the anatomy of the meninge to try to understand what is happening when fluids accumulate around the brain. Uh, I won't uh, learn you anything, and I'm sure that everyone is very confident with that, but I remember you that the external layer of the arachnoid uh, is closely uh, attached to the dura, and in physiological condition, there are no subdural space, and CSF uh, can flow uh, within the cerebrachnoid space. When a trauma, a trauma happened uh, on, this, uh, on the skull, uh, there probably uh, there are two uh, basic situations. The first one is uh, the appearance of a subdural space due to what is called uh, uh, arachnoid tear. And so this uh, virtual normally virtual subdural space can uh, be enlarged and uh, passive fluid uh, can fill this space that can be uh, blood in the case of uh, subdural uh, hematoma, uh, but it can also be some CSF and unfortunately sometimes it is very different to uh, make the difference between uh, chronicized very old chronicist hematoma and uh, CSF. But in this situation, the, uh, this new volume is compensated by uh, CSF withdrawal out of the craniospinal cavity. So uh, the total volume within the craniospinal cavity uh, remain, uh, re re remain balanced and the ICP uh, remain most of the time normal. Of course, I exclude for, uh, from this definition uh, active uh, subdural hematoma, which uh, is not the subject of the topic. But uh, I just am talking about this accumulation of CSF uh, with no impact on intracranial uh, pressure. This situation uh, can concern only one side. Uh, or both sides. And uh, one thing that is important is that uh, in this uh, situation, normally the subarachnoid space are not enlarged. And uh, uh, easier uh, to, to check is the Sylvian fissure. Uh, and another marker is that uh, in, in, in case of passive fluid sequestration, uh, just uh, as I, I told you earlier, the, the, the brain will withdraw some CSF to uh, maintain a normal ICP. So uh, you can see uh, sometimes a decrease of ventricle uh, size. The uh, other situation that may ap appear, and especially when a subarachnoid hemorrhage occur uh, following the traumatic brain injury, is a disturbance in the CSF flow or in the CSF resorption. And in that case, uh, there will be uh, an accumulation of CSF within the craniospinal cavity. And uh, in opposite to the former situation, uh, the, 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 physi the, the physiology won't uh, uh, apply and the, the, there are no possibility of CSF withdrawal to maintain a normal ICP. And so in that case of disturb uh, CSF flow, the ICP will raise. Uh, in this situation, most, uh, most of the time, uh, the extraxial collection will be bilateral 
and will be accompanied then uh, by an enlargement of the subarachnoid space, and in particular in the sylvian fissure. Unfortunately, uh, things can be very uh, difficult because uh, we can have some mixed situation with a subdural uh, space fill, uh, filled with a CSF, but also uh, a, a disturbance uh, in CSF flow and CSF resorptions. So in this mixed condition, uh, it will be uh, more difficult to understand what is happening. So the, the message is that uh, collection around the brain uh, can be very similar on CT scan, but can uh, uh, be very uh, different in the, uh, in the results on the ICP and on the CSF dynamics. And it will uh, be important to difference these two situations uh, because the treatment won't be the same. In this very, very interesting uh, publication from, uh, from uh, a Korean group, uh, um, they enlighten this uh, important point to make the difference between uh, subdural hygroma and uh, external hydrocephalus. And uh, in this very uh, smart uh, publication, they measure the CSF pressure uh, before opening the dura in uh, people uh, who had some uh, extra uh, extra cerebral um, fluid collection uh, and before uh, evacuating uh, the, the collection they measure the the pressure within the cranium and so they uh, classified the patient in a group of raised ICP uh, that were considered as external hydrocephalus uh, one quarter of the patient has a raised ICP and in this population, uh, the ICP what was, mm, of, of course, much more important. And a large majority of the patient developed a secondary ventricular enlargement and a secondary post-traumatic hydrocephalus, as we talk about uh, in the first part. In the, the other group, the pressure was low. It, uh, it uh, was uh, found in three quarters of the patient, and this group was considered as subdural hygroma. None of the, uh, all these patients were shunted. None of these patients were shunted. None developed uh, secondary ventricular enlargement and secondary hydrocephalus. Uh, seven of them, so uh, about the half, had a complete resolution of the collection, whereas uh, the other ones had a persistent collection, but without clinical uh, consequences. So this, for us, it, it was a very important paper, and it, it has it, it encourages us uh, to to as uh, this uh, uh, this reflection on this extraaxial post-traumatic extraaxial fluid collections. So let's go with another uh, case to, to illustrate. Yeah. Uh, to finish uh, the lecture, we want to speak about the acute external hydrocephalus in ICU. It, it is my, uh, my job. I, I like when the patient uh, has a, a high ICP because it's my work to decrease this ICP. And uh, I want to speak about this patient because it's very important patient for us to understand this concept of external hydrocephalus. So this patient has uh, uh, um, a fall backward of uh, high chair. So it's not very high uh, fall, but very large consequences with the contusion of frontal contusion and the subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, important. And uh, the first day the ICP was low. And uh, four days later, we have uh, a very high ICP. And uh, well, the patient uh, has had a deep anesthesia and uh, osmoth osmotherapy and all the treatments. And uh, we have no solution. So I called uh, Roman and uh, we decided to uh, analyze the picture. And like you can see here, we have a collection of CSF just under the skull 
and an arrangement of the critical Celsi. And I put only one uh, picture because we have no time to show all the CT scan, but it's, you, you can trust me that the, the, this uh, thin thickness of CSF was around the brain. And we decided to, to make lumbar puncture for these patients. Uh, and like you can see on this uh, graph, the ICP was very high because it's 40, uh, 20s here, 40s here, and the red line is the ICP. And the gray line is the CPP. Uh, so the patient uh, was put on the uh, um, uh, le left side and we start the puncture. And uh, in 15 minutes, we normalized the pressure because we removed the CSF uh, with 15 milliliters of CSF because we were on the right side of the long skid curve. So a sl a low volume uh, has a big, had big consequences on the ISCP. And with this low uh, diminution of volume, we have a big diminution of ICP with normalization of the ICP. So, it's a little bit dangerous because ISP was very high, but to uh, to be safe, we take the pressure in same time on the ICP, uh, on the brain, and on the CSF, on the lumbar puncture, and we check that when we decrease the volume of CSF, we have the same decreasing of the pressure on the brain and in the lumbar uh, uh, area. And we can see on this CT scan six days later that uh, with the lumbar drainage, we have uh, this, uh, the, the CSF disappear in this part of the brain. We have not this thin thickness of CSF. And we have to remember that two millimeters of CSF is 100 milliliters, milliliter of uh, CSF in the uh, brain. So it's important that why the ICP was very high because the patient can't remove and uh, the outflow of CSF was not possible. And we help the patient to remove the CSF to treat the, 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 the etiology of the high ICP. So we, we, after this first case, we developed uh, uh, some, uh, we, we, we uh, had discussion with uh, several team in France and we decided to use this technique for this specific patient with accumulation of CSF around the brain. And we published our series of 33 patients uh, to three years ago. And we can uh, read our paper uh, to have all the details. But uh, in this, in this uh, series, we can uh, show that it's very efficient to decrease the pressure without side effect. It's another example of uh, accumulation. Like you can see here, we have a, a excess of CSF here. And uh, we check that there is communication uh, of the, of the uh, hydrocephaly because it's very important to, uh, to, to, pray, to uh, avoid uh, engagement. So you can see here on this graph that there is a, a very uh, important effect on the ICP with the normalization of the ICP for the, for the patient. And it is not very long time uh, drainage because only five days uh, mean, uh, mean duration is seven days, sorry. And the mean delay of insertion is five days. In, our, in my series in Cambridge, the uh, external hydrocephalus uh, on the CT scan appears after three days of the traumatic brain injury. So we are going to summarize our uh, present our lecture with a, a message. And uh, to finish, we, are, we want to share with you our favorite patient. Uh, five minutes, we have, we could be finished. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so briefly, uh, in the situation of uh, subdural hygroma, which means an accumulation of CSF around the brain without a raised ICP and without clinical uh, consequences, uh, nothing uh, must be done and the patient must be closely observed, but most of the time it will resolve uh, spontaneously. The opposite situation, uh, as illustrated by Laurent, is the problem of external hydrocephalus with um, abnormal accumulation of CSF in a situation of raised ICP, where normally the, C the, the brain will withdraw as much as CSF as possible to lower the ICP. Unfortunately, there are some uh, difficult situations 
with where the diagnosis is uh, not possible uh, and not clear. And uh, in case of uh, increasing collection of or uh, uh, doubt uh, on the on the diagnosis, it's uh, it's uh, there's need of uh, evacuation. And as Laurent told, in the situation of external hydrocephalus, uh, it can be treated by lumbar drainage. Uh, so the key points for the old talk is that people who have been cared in ICU for traumatic brain injury uh, and in who uh, the clinical course uh, in rehabilitation is abnormal with a failure to improve, a stop in improvement or worsening, you have to pay attention uh, to the possibility of uh, CSF disorders. And as uh, we told you, the, the, the sooner is the diagnosis, the sooner is the treatment, and the better is the prognosis. Once again, uh, ventriculomegaly with low ICP, you have to uh, look at the CSF dynamics and uh, to uh, make the difference between atrophy and uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, the, the atrophy must uh, receive no treatment uh, when the post-traumatic hydrocephalus must be uh, shunted as soon as possible. Uh, this slide I, I told you uh, just uh, a couple of year, uh, a, a couple of minutes ago. Two minutes, Marek. Uh, I try to make it in two minutes. This is a very uh, important case we published uh, recently uh, that uh, start with uh, a donkey. Uh, we uh, start to manage this patient 10 days after a, a traumatic brain injury. He was pushed down by, by uh, the, the donkey. He, he fell and had a mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, and when we, uh, we uh, had this patient, he was in a very cognitive impairment status and he was waiting for a retirement house because he, he, he couldn't uh, go back to his house because he, he was living uh, alone. Um, and we were very surprised by the CT scan with this accumulation of uh, fluid around the brain. So. Um, we went back on the initial uh, initial admission. Uh, as I told you, it was a, a light traumatic brain injury. Uh, if you look uh, uh, carefully, you can see a small subarachnoid MRH within the Sylvian fissure. Uh, and so we uh, were not agree with the diagnosis of subdural hygroma, and we were not very confident with the management waiting for the uh, uh, house, uh, retirement house. So we uh, went to the patient, we made uh, an assessment of his cognitive status. And as you see, he has a low MMSE and the transcranial Doppler was in favor of a raised ICP. So we decided uh, to uh, make a, a lumbar puncture uh, to measure uh, the, the ICP and the opening pressure was at 20 millimeter of mercury. So we carefully and slowly withdraw 20 milliliter of uh, CSF that uh, uh, lower uh, very quickly the ICP. And the, the closure pressure was, uh, I don't remember exactly, but less than 10 millimeter of mercury. And the morning after the puncture, the MMSE was raised at 26 and at uh, uh, three months. Uh, so the patient was discharged home and he was uh, completely recovered on the cognitive uh, point of view. Uh, but uh, I follow him up very carefully. And during the following months, he was good. But uh, slowly he uh, declined and uh, he described some uh, some gait impairment. Uh, he was use, used to uh, make hike and he was he had big difficulties in this. And if you look at the CT scan, you see a clear enlargement of the ventricle. So uh, I, I, I did a, a infusion study that show increased 
uh, resistance to CSF outflow, and so the patient was shunted and he recovered fully uh, with a normal uh, walk. So the miss, th this clinical uh, is very important because uh, post-traumatic CSF disorders do not only concern uh, severe TBI, and they do not only concern uh, increase in ventricular size. And so we thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And we hope that uh, there are uh, time for discussion. Good, great. Thank you very much. That's absolutely great. What happened to his donkey? <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he gave it uh, to somebody because he was too afraid uh, ah, to yes. care okay. about. <laughs> Thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you. We Thank learned. you, Marek. Um, we have some questions in uh, question and answer um, uh, uh, box. So we start with this. And whoever's got additional questions, which is emerging from your answers and from the lecture, please put this in question and answer box. The first question um, uh, from Dr. Karimi. Uh, do you have any experience about lymphatic system study in patients after traumatic brain injury. I understand that this is concerning acute hydrocephalus or acute CSF disorders. So do you have any experience with glymphatic? Thank, thank you for this uh, very interesting question. Uh, glymphatics are obviously uh, a very uh, ongoing uh, um, pathophysiological uh, understanding of hydrocephalus. To my knowledge, there are no uh, description of uh, glymphatic impairments following traumatic brain injury in clinical studies. But I don't know if you I, have. I, I, I have just a remark. No, no, I, there is nothing about the glymphatic and traumatic uh, brain injury and ventricular megaly, I think. But the a remark is some patient has uh, occlusion of the third ventricles or the fourth ventricle with blood. Sometimes it's uh, dramatic with very high ICP and the patient dies very quickly. And sometimes the patient are fine. So if the, the circulation is occluded and the patient are, are, are okay, for sure the CSF has other way to leave the brain. So probably the glymphatic has a very important role, but for my knowledge, I don't know exactly um, what happened in traumatic brain injury in particular, but for sure it's one argument for the existence of the glymphatic. Okay, so we can say we don't know really. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You need to understand that in science, any kind of the project you have in science, you have three answers. Yes, no, or I don't know. And yeah. I don't know it's probably 80% of cases. So we need to be very humble. So thank you very much for your honest answer. Second question is very much challenging and it's longer. So nice presentation. Nevertheless, in Ian's course, we need some additional details to understand why to treat a huge basal frontal contusion with 30 millimeter mercury of ICP with lumbar CSF withdrawal, despite uh, suggestion of French study about contraindication of lumbar drainage when intraparenchymal mass are present. Mm. Maybe could the late onset of increasing value of ICP justify this strategy? This is an excellent yeah. remark, and uh, uh, we think we thank the, the 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 colleague who asked this question and. Uh, if we look back in our uh, maybe in our uh, criteria for external hydrocephalus and treatment with uh, lumbar drainage, um, we uh, we uh, sorry describe that it is important. Uh, oh, sorry, 
uh, it is important uh, that there are no mass effects. Uh, however, in this particular case, I think uh, maybe the, 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 the choice of the slice were not uh, the, the, the best ones, but to my point of view, uh, large frontal contusion, uh, the, 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 the removal, surgical removal of such contusion may, uh, uh, may result in uh, cognitive impairment in the, in the, in the, in the post-operative course and the post-traumatic course. And in, in this uh, particular case, we decided uh, to treat it with uh, a lumbar drainage because this uh, frontal contusion was not so big and uh, uh, did not result in a significant mass effect. And uh, we were very convinced uh, of the abnormal collection of CSF in this situation of raised ICP. Once again, it is very important uh, to uh, consider that uh, normal ventricular size and collection of CSF in a situation of raised ICP is not normal because normally uh, the, the, skull, the, the, the skull box do everything uh, to lower its volume and so normally he uh, withdraw uh, the CSF and in severe TBI with raised ICP most of the time the ventricle are very thin because uh, the, the CSF has, has been removed. So in a patient with, uh, um, with uh, 30, uh, yes, we don't have uh, axial slice. Yeah, so uh, in, 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 uh, we don't have the axial slice of the CT scan, but uh, I'm sure that uh, there are much uh, CSF around the brain uh, and it's not normal when you have uh, ICP at 30. Uh, the other point very important that uh, it was not the first patient that uh, in the story that where we put uh, lumbar drainage in this indication. Exposed. And uh, we developed uh, confidence probably uh, behavior for this patient. And the other very important point that we take the pressure. We take the pressure in the same time on lumbar and ICP. And if the, there is no gradient of pressure between the brain and the lumbar region, there is no risk of engagement. How because... can you, how can you, how can you be sure that there is no um, uh, blockage? How we are sure there is no blockage? No blockage for CSF and no gradient of intracranial pressure. Uh, in the we 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 control the the basal system before. Uh -huh. And we, we have to be, if there is no communication, no lumbar drainage, never. It's, okay. it's a, a very important point. But if you took the pressure in the same time as the boss, if you remove CSF in lumbar drainage and the, CSF, the pressure decrease in lumbar and remain yeah. very high in the brain, you have to stop immediately. So we start with five milliliters of the CSF, we took the pressure, and after we carry on, we stop. And another another important point is that we do it with the patient in strict in strict supine position. We do not uh, let the patient at thirty degree uh, proclive, because we may uh, it it may result in a, a pressure gradient between uh, the the cranial cavity and the lumbar cavity, and we must avoid it. Yep. So uh, the, the patient is, uh, is positioned in strict supine position with uh, the level of the cranial cavity at the same level of the lumbar, uh, the lumbar cavity and with the concomitant measurement of ICP within cranial cavity and CSF pressure within lumbar uh, cavity. And Good. as soon so as- Thank you very much. Right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we, we understand your explanations. I can tell to the audience the story about our discussion in Cambridge. You remember we've been presenting this case, this particular case to Professor Hutchinson, his neurosurgeon, and he said, okay, maybe lumbar puncture and lumbar drainage is not that safe. Maybe we can uh, opt for subarachnoid drainage. 
is it still uh, in your opinion feasible or um, taking the very simple and very easy approach using lumbar drainage you still opt for lumbar drainage i remember very good this uh, this remark of professor chitson uh, definitely if you remove the csf and the subarachnoid space it's okay but it's yeah. uh, it's more in, invasive and uh, in my experience and i carry on now to to put lumbar drainage because it's very simple and the, the other point is that our experience in in putting some uh, a subdural catheter uh, external or uh, or, or subdural uh, ventricular shunt uh, is 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 not very um, efficient because as you have a, a big icp when you put the 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 catheter uh, within the sub subarachnoid space, uh, the CSF around the catheter will be withdraw very fast, and the brain will uh, will come okay. uh, and occlude the catheter. So, in the the patient where, where we were not confident to insert a lumbar drainage and we put a, a, a subarachnoid drain. Most of the time, it was not efficient. And in, in the CT scan, we see that the, the catheter was occluded by the, the, the brain. OK, we need to go on because we have a lot of questions. In external hydrocephalus, which technique is the best? Ventricular peritoneal, subdural peritoneal, or lumbar peritoneal? Uh, in, acute, in acute care, for me, it's lumbar. Uh, after lumbar. Okay. The, External, okay. external hydrocephalus is acute. So we know lumbar, that's your answer. Very good. Thank you for your presentation. That's another question. How many patients with external hydrocephalus with previous ELD have a shunt? Uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, in our series, uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure, but we, we have to, to go back to, to the, the publication, I think. Uh, five patients uh, on the receive a, 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 a shunt uh, because they developed uh, chronic hydrocephalus. So, in our experience, most of the patients with external acute hydrocephalus do not develop uh, further uh, chronic hydrocephalus with, with need of shunt. But but it was before we start yeah. the systematic screening. Yeah, they, 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 uh, we, we were in this series, we don't have a very long follow-up of the patients. Okay, and the second question or sub-question of the same person, this is Corentin Daulek. I'm very sorry if I pronounce the name. No, I know him very well. <laughs> what about the timing for shunt in external hydrocephalus patients? Yeah, once again, it's an acute problem, uh, most of the time in ICU. So it is, is, a, is a problem of raised ICP. So the, the timing is as soon as possible. It's, uh, mm. it's uh, uh, the same emergency as uh, a classic acute hydrocephalus who need uh, ventricular, uh, external ventricular drainage. Okay, so another question from Ronald Musa. Can MRI differentiate between hygroma and external hydrocephalus? You want to answer? <laughs> uh, the difference is, uh, the most important I think is the accumulation of CSF in the subarachnoid space. And uh, Sylvian, uh, Sylvian um, sure. fissure is very important. The interhemispheric fissure. And uh, in the same time, it's important to check the volume of the ventricles because in the igroma, the ventricles decrease, uh, the size of the ventricle decrease because the CSF can, could be removed because there is no problem of resorption and uh, the brain makes place to have, to have a low ICP. For uh, the external hydrocephalus, the patient can not remove the CSF, so the CSF uh, remain in the brain and the, in the ventricles. So it's a big difference is the volume of CSF. Is the, is, is the, the aim of the concept because 
the accumulation of CSS is the origin of, the, of, of our problem of ICP. So it's logic to remove the CSF when it's the, the etiology of the I, ICP. Okay, thank you very much. So another question from Alexandre Picour. Hello, do you remove lumbar drain in external hydrocephalus or do you implant sand in these cases? I think we we answered. We answered Sorry. just before. The most most uh, often we can remove the drain after seven days, and uh, only a little part has need a, a shunt, definitive shunt immediately. But I want to insist that we didn't uh, screen all the patients uh, in this period. And uh, now, with my experience, I saw I see that more and more patients need shunt when you screen uh, accuracy the patient after ICU. Good. Next question for Antonios Krasovdakis. Is flow void uh, of uh, cerebrospinal fluid in Sylvian Fisher a prognostic factor for whom to treat or to differentiate between external hydrocephalus or, uh, sub, uh, or hygromas? A flow void within the sylvian fissure. Yes, I, a I prognostic have, factor. I have, I, I don't know. I have, uh, oh, I yes, didn't that's read good. anything. That's good scientific answer. I don't know. 8%. Alexandr Oswiski. Alexandr Oswiski. Have you had any child patients with symptomatic hydrocephalus? If yes, what treatment you use? I don't uh, understand this question. Sure understand. Acute? I understand that it uh, concerns uh, uh, acute post traumatic hydrocephalus. Uh, in fact, the, 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 what is commonly uh, called post traumatic hydrocephalus, uh, uh, which means ventriculomegaly and clinical signs. Most of the, the, the publication uh, concern patient in rehabilitation uh, phase. So it's a chronic problem. So it, 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 after a t uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, acute classic hydrocephalus is not so frequent because uh, you need uh, to have uh, a sufficient amount of blood to block the CSF flow uh, so it's not the most common situation uh, yeah, but we see this in in uh, yes acute hydrocephalus for me before i met you i must say and learned about external hydrocephalus acute hydrocephalus post-traumatic brain injury that was not communicating hydrocephalus because blood or no on thrombus was blocking some pathways of yes. Yes, sure. exactly circulation um, uh, and that could hydrocephalus was presenting with high ICP yeah, um, sure. around ventricles and so on and so forth and demanded QDVD. But external hydrocephalus is something new, which is coming uh, to my mind. And now I know how to, how to, how to advise my neurosurgical colleagues. So it's, it's good that we have right. something. Our, our message is not to say that uh, normal classic uh, acute hydrocephalus does not exist, but it it's, it's more uh, freak, it's less frequent than uh, saying after aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, for example, in yes. which situation the the frequency of um, acute hydrocephalus is much more yes. important. It's 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 important. That it's, my lesson from if I can save. A little bit from myself is that uh, interestingly and ob automatically obviously in fact it is partly because it's much easier to see in large ventricles than in large subarachnoid space and this is why we've been omitting external hydrocephalus for quite a long time not paying attention to what happens to the volume of subarachnoid space great so another question Corrado uh, Locarino. 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 70 millimeter of mercury of ICP value is not a proper low mass effect. Could maybe the enlargement of the arachnoidal space encourage the uh, 
um, maneuver of CSF drainage. I don't understand that much this question, I must say. Should I repeat it? 30 yeah. value. Could maybe the enlargement of subarachnoid space encourage the maneuver of CSF drainage? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I uh, understand the question, but uh, it's not a po our point of view because uh, it's the same story as with the lumbar, the, the, the subdural drain. If uh, there's place and way for the CSF to uh, get out of the skull box, it will go and it will not accumulate around the brain. I, 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 I hope I answered the question, but I'm Good. not sure. Next, Harold Ricade. Uh, hello, Hal. It was a very good discussion. It's not a question, it's a comment. The previous question worked well. You showed very important aspect of looking at the basal systems when considering lumbar drainage. Congratulations on the presentation. So you don't need to uh, answer this. Um, Raja. Raja Shekhar, thank you very Kaitali. much for this. For NPH, can we use lumbar peritoneal shunt or programmable ventricle peritoneal shunt? Which one is better? So uh, sorry, peritoneal... we had a, a short uh, problem with connection. Uh, we, we thank uh, Professor Ricate for the, the nice comments. And could you repeat the? Yeah, okay. Question, so, yes, I know I know that you indulge with uh, uh, compliments from uh, Professor <laughs> NPH, uh, which shunt you want to, uh, you would prefer, lumboperitoneal shunt or programmable ventricular peritoneal shunt? Which one? Mm -hmm. um, in, in, during my residency, I, I, I've been formed with uh, the use of uh, ventricular uh, uh, of a lum lumbo lumbar peritoneal shunt, uh, but uh, I moved to the ventriculo peritoneal shunt or atrial uh, ventriculo atrial shunt uh, because uh, with programmable valve uh, because uh, I had too much problem with uh, subdural uh, collection uh, after the the insertion of lumbo peritoneal shunt. So now I use the uh, ventriculoperitoneal peritoneal uh, when there are no history of uh, abdominal surgery. And if I have any doubts, uh, I go for a uh, ventriculoatrial shunt. Good. Do you use contrast enhanced CT to see whether vessels are close to brain or closer to dura mater to differentiate between external hydrocephalus and hygroma? Now that's an uh, interesting uh, comment, but we never uh, did that, but good. The last question, what is your explanation that single LP in external hydrocephalus is solving the impaired CSF dynamics? This is a good question, in my opinion. Very, very good question. Uh, uh, I think it's the same, uh, it's the same unclear uh, treatment as when you do a uh, lumbar puncture in the diagnosis of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. You improve the patient by removing uh, 50 milliliter of CSF. You, we know that in three or four hours, this amount of CSF has been uh, produced by the, the choroidal plexus, uh, but the Improvement after this lumbar puncture uh, can sometimes uh, long, long last uh, several weeks or several months, and we don't exactly know why. Uh, the explanation is the dural tear uh, that may withdraw some CSF uh, very slowly, but honestly, we don't have a clear uh, answer. What is interesting in, in this, uh, in this uh, case report is that uh, 
the, the CSF flow was uh, definitely uh, impaired because it progressively enlarged its ventricle during the, the month after the, the story. So the lumbar puncture uh, treat acutely uh, the problem of quite raised ICP, but it do not resolve the, um, the problem of CSF uh, flow impairment. And so probably in our series of lumbar drainage in uh, external hydrocephalus, we missed some uh, long lasting um, uh, chronic hydrocephalus. Okay, so Mohamed uh, Savalhi, is there an indication for double ventricular peritoneal and subarachnoid peritoneal shunt? Y technique in brackets in external hydrocephalus. That's uh, a good, good comment, but once again, in our experience, uh, there are the, the, the first phase of external hydrocephalus is an acute uh, onset of CSF disorder. And the, the problem of uh, chronic CSF disorder will probably convert in a classic um, uh, post-traumatic hydrocephalus with ventriculomegaly. Uh, and we will put uh, a ventriculoperitoneal or ventriculoarterial shunt. And uh, in, in my experience uh, of uh, shunting patients with CSF disorders, when you multiply the, the drain and you complexify the, the shunt, you uh, understand less and less what you are doing, and you don't understand when the patient don't go uh, well. So I think we must uh, stay simple. And we know for decades uh, that uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt or ventricular atrial shunt yeah. works very well. So I think it's no and need to. Another point to complete that uh, the external endocephalus disappears when the patient uh, go in the prone posture. I think it's a very important. It's my feeling when uh, now I work a little bit more in rehabilitation center, the patient, when they go on the chair or leave the, the bed, the more and more the external occupation disappears for an enlargement of the ventricles. So uh, probably it's not a question about the drainage of uh, external occupation for the long time. It's only an ICU problem. Great. So another one is congratulations for Marwin Nayar. And the last question at the moment, Enrico Urcolo, which type of DVP, I don't know what is DVP, do you use in post-traumatic hydrocephalus? The, what, what sort of what? Sorry. Which type of DVP do you ah, use? Oh, oh, the, oh, the, the, the device, we, we use the French uh, device, Sofisa. Oh, come on. I can't believe Which is very, German. very good. We are not sponsored, <laughs> but it's, it is, it is a good. Uh, you use Polaris, yeah? yeah? yeah. Yes. Good, great. Fantastic. So this is the end of the questions. I need to congratulate you. That was a very good um, session, um, very much informative and very much stimulating. We learned from this session that external hydrocephalus, this super acute hydrocephalus, where the only obstacle for CSF circulation is impairment of pachyone granulations and impairment of cerebrospinal fluid reabsorption to uh, venous blood exists. And it leads to enlargement of uh, subarachnoid space. And management of this early type of hydrocephalus is very important because it saves time, it saves medication, it saves time for um, uh, mechanical ventilation, and also saves uh, um, uh, cases of converting this acute hydrocephalus to chronic hydrocephalus, which is subsequently more difficult for uh, uh, management. Obviously, there are different types of um, uh, post-traumatic hydrocephalus, like hydrocephalus related or being the effect or case 
or, or side effect of uh, the compressive craniectomy. And this is a late of hydrocephalus. We haven't been discussing this today. So it may be another um, uh, webinar in the future where we have the total classification of post-traumatic hydrocephalus, which is, which, is, uh, which is really a common, which is really common disturbing good outcome of our patients following traumatic brain injury. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, can I add oh, something? Yes. I Mother, want to... do you want? Sosia. Hello. Hi, Sosia. Hi, Sosia. That's okay. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> this is private. Uh, 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 Mansour, do you want to ask to have some finishing sentence? A, a fantastic and excellent presentation. The, this was really full of major excellent points, well chaired, and uh, the beautiful French delivery with such elegance as well. Uh, really, really fantastic. Um, it was a pleasure to, to listen to. Wonderful. Well done, team. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye.